All right, we want to say a special welcome once more. If you've just logged on, listen, you're at the right place. And we ask even now that you will hang with us. Go ahead now and do your, your, your digital discipleship work now. Just copy that link and post this link now either in your personal WhatsApp group. Post this link now either in your Facebook page. Let's get your friends and your co-workers, yea, even your enemies, to see what the good Lord has in store for us. Friends, we have been contemplating this wonderful theme, the theme of repentance, and what a theme it has been. We're on lesson number 12, the second installment of the fifth point, hatred for sin. Our thematic text is Acts 5.31, where Luke writes, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and savior, for to give repentance to Israel and even the forgiveness of sins. Thomas Watson said, Tomorrow may be our dying day. Let today be our repenting day. Friends, and we are in the season of repentance. To everything there is a purpose and every season under the sun. And we are in the season of repentance where God wants to give repentance, not just to us, but to the entire world. And the devil has an object, you know, in this season. It is his plan for us to live a sinful life, to be unconcerned about where we will spend eternity be unconcerned about the things that pertain to our salvation or our well-being and be concerned and be, be absorbed or engrossed in the mundane things of this world. We are told in the book Great Controversy that the great controversy between Christ and Satan, this, this, this cosmic battle, has been in progress now for nearly 6,000 years and we are at the end. It is soon to close. And the wicked one, he redoubles his efforts to defeat the work of Christ on man's behalf, to fasten souls in his snares. And he has a multiplicity of snares. You know, it is said that when a, when a good trapper or a good hunter goes out to hunt, what he does, he brings multiple traps. And he sets an obvious trap for the creature he's trying to catch. And when that creature sees that obvious trap, he now tries to back up or to, 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 to divest himself from that trap he gets caught in another, friends. And that is why we need the help of Jesus. He, to fasten souls in his seer, sneers, to hold the people in darkness and in penitence, which is, by definition, is an unrepentant state. This is the object in which Satan seeks to accomplish, brothers and sisters. The last work that Jesus Christ is performing now in the heavenly sanctuary is a work of repentance. God's last call to the last church of Laodicea is a call to repentance. We've discussed that repentance is like an onion. There are several and multiple layers to an onion. And as we begin to peel back the layers of repentance, we realize that we ourselves have had a suit of repentance. We had not really and truly you know, embrace this thing that it is needful for our soul salvation. We've discussed that in order for our repentance to be acceptable to God, our repentance must, must embrace six stages. There must be sight for sin. There must be sorrow for sin. Friends, there must be a confession of sin. There must be shame of sin. There must be hatred for sin. And there must be a turning from sin. And if any one of these are left out, then our repentance loses its efficacy. It is not acceptable to God. And the devil doesn't mind that we, you know, adhere to, to three. Or someone will say four to five is not bad. That's 80%. Or four to six is not bad. No, friends. We must embrace all these six stages of repentance. And so tonight, we're going to now bring to a close the second installment of hatred of sin. Hatred for sin is the fifth ingredient in this theme called repentance. We've learned last week in Ezekiel 36 verse 31 where Ezekiel says, Then shall he remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Friends, we have discussed that that word loathe means hate. 
And we've discussed that we will never love Christ until we hate sin. Heaven will never be long for while we are still practicing sin. There must be a hatred for sin. You know, today, friends, uh, we, as we look at what, 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 what is happening in the world today, especially in the, the recent shootings of, of law enforcement officers in regards to, 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 to civilians, and, and, and we're saying, you know, why can't they find another way? We even look at the recent death of Mr. George Floyd, and, and, and yesterday when, when Mr. Derek Chauvin was, was sentenced, friends, you know, the whole world rejoiced. We rejoice, and it is a, it is a sad, sad because nobody wins. Uh, Mr. Floyd is in the grave decomposing, and this man is about to spend the rest of his natural mortal life, maybe in isolation, maybe in a cell for 23 hours. So nobody really wins. And, and as we look at these things, friends, you know, as we look at the, how this man died, it fostered a hatred. Be honest. You were angry. You were upset. And... You, you were mad and you, you felt you wanted a piece of Mr. Derek Chauvin and, 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 and all the other officers. Friends, did you know, friends, that unless we cultivate by the grace of God that same hatred that we have for Mr. Well, some have for Mr. Derek Chauvin and the act he did, if we don't have that same hatred for sin, friends, we're going to be lost. Someone put a post, someone reached out to me in a, a messenger and said, you know, is it, you know, can Mr. Chauvin be saved? I said to him that it's joined to all living, there is hope. There is hope as long as there is life, brothers and sisters. And would, wouldn't it be a thing if Mr. Chauvin beat many of us to, to the kingdom of God? Wouldn't it be a shame or, 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 or irony or, or a tragedy rather? Friends, the same hatred we have towards the, the act that was perpetrated by Mr. Floyd and even Mr. Chauvin, that's the same hatred that we must cultivate for sin. And, 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 and how, does God, how does God view things? You know, as we look at what is happening now, there's a quotation that I want you to jot down, education page 150. This is a, this is a powerful statement. And it puts things in perspective now. We're told the strongest bulwark of vice in our world is not the inequitous life of the abandoned sinner. It's not the life of Derek Chauvin. No, friends. It is that life which otherwise appears virtuous, honorable, noble, but in which one sin is fostered, one vice indulged. That is the, the strongest bulwark of vice. And when, when God looks upon a life, it is almost contemptuous in his sight. That life is not the life, that she says, of the abundant and degraded sinner. It is that life, that profession that, that, that appears virtuous and, and, and honorable and noble, but in which one sin is fostered, one vice indulged. Friends, there must be a hatred for sin. Now let's, we're gonna dive a little bit deeper now into this theme, this concept of the fifth ingredient of hatred force in which we must all cultivate by the grace of God. Number one in your handout says, question one in your handout says now, we're filling in the blanks as usual. <clears throat> it says now, how did Ammon hate Tamar? Now Tamar was the sister of the, 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 the Jacob, Jacob's sons. And we know what happened. There was a, a sexual altercation. It was a love-hate relationship. And there was a sexual altercation that happened in the situation. Now look how Look the hatred. Look, look at what this man had. How did Haman hate Tamar? Second Samuel, we find it now. Second Samuel 13, verse 15 says now, Then Ammon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Ammon said unto her, Arise and be gone. This man then loved, then he hated, but the Bible says that he hated her, what? Exceedingly. He didn't just hate her, friends. He hated her exceedingly, friends. Now, natural things is always a medium for the spiritual, and it is through the known, the blessed Lord make known the things of the unknown. So what can we draw from this 
situation now, friends. Note, just, just, just as Ammon's hatred for Tamar was greater than his love for her, so we should hate sin infinitely more than we ever loved it. It's kind of fuzzy. Let me just kind of, I think I have a, a slide. Um, just kind of. All right, let's get back to it now. All right, here it is now. Just, <clears throat> just as how Ammon's hatred of Tamar was greater than his love for her, so we should hate sin infinitely more than we ever loved. Friends, our hatred for sin must be exceedingly great. As a matter of fact, we should come to a point in our lives. And friends, if we have not reached that point, God have mercy upon us. We would rather die than sin. We are told in volume 5 of the testimonies, page 142, we are told, choose poverty, reproach, slander, separation from friends, or any suffering rather than defile the soul with sin. Death before dishonor or the transgression of the law of God should be the motto of every Christian. Friends, we should come to a point in our lives Mentally, where we'd rather die that our hatred for sin is so exceedingly great that we would rather die than commit a known sin. We'd rather, we'd rather burn than turn. We'd rather die than to deny the law of God. So as we now begin to survey the hatred that we must have in regards to sin, number two now, what is heaven's stance in regards to Sin and the sinner. What is heaven's stance in regards to sin and the sinner? How does the triune Godhead, the heavenly trio, views the sinner and sin? We are told in the book of Psalms, Psalms chapter 5, verse number 4. David says now, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. Brothers and sisters, based on this text, we can deduce that the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, yea, the, the heavenly beings, heaven hates sin with a particular hatred. But he loves the sinner with a perfect love. And God has a problem now. What's his problem? How will he destroy sin without destroying the sinner? And the, the challenge at heaven, that heavens, that, have, that the challenge that is on heaven's table now is how do I separate sin from the sinner, and how do I destroy sin without destroying the sinner? Because when Jesus comes, wherever sin is found, friends, it will be eradicated. And so the the scalpel, the, the surgical procedure which Jesus is now using to separate sin from the sinner is repentance. We are told in Prophets and Kings. Page 84, God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. God hates sin, but God loves the sinner. So we see now heaven's perspective on sin and sinners. He hates the sin, but yet he loves the sinner. He will destroy the sin. He doesn't want to destroy the sinner. And the only way the sinner can be saved, he must separate from sin. And the medium by which God is using is the theme of repentance. Let's go a little deeper. on Number three now, how does the world regard sin and the sinner? We, we see heaven's perspective now. He hates sin. Wickedness will not dwell in his sight. And that is why, you know, if the sinner was taken to heaven right now in his, in his state, heaven will be, would be a boring place. Because he'll be a fish out of water. His nature could not relate to that. So we see how heaven views sin. How does the world view sin? You know, the Bible says, the world loveth its own. The world loveth its own. Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 15 gives us a glimpse as how the world, the worldian, how he regards sin and the sinner. Jeremiah chapter 11 verse 15 says now, What hath my beloved done 
in mine house, seeing she has wrought lewdness with many, and the holy flesh is passed from thee, when, when thou doest evil, then thou rejoice. Brothers and sisters, the, the world's attitude for sin in a large majority is with rejoicing. They marry. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says, fool makes a mock at sin. They rejoice in iniquity. They do not rejoice in the truth. And that is why we see the world is at odds with God. Because God hates sin, loves the sinner. The world rejoice in sin. Yea, he, he, he affirms the sinner. And isn't it true? We've learned the more viler, the more vicious, the more vagabondish a man is, is, is the more he, he's deified, he's idolized, he's put up on a pedestal. And they're right. As a matter of fact, in these rough ages, we find this powerful statement about men, the world, sin. Sin as we're told now, please read now, men hate the sinner. Men hate the sinner while they love the sin. That's the world. The world. It is, is, isn't it ironic? What do you mean? Friends, what, Mr. De what Derek Chauvin did to, to Mr. Floyd was horrendous. But friends, we see these acts being carried out every day in movies. We see murder, people's head getting blown away. So here it is now, it is true, we, we hate the sinner, but then we love the sin. We'll watch it on television, friends. That's the world's concept. Please read now. Christ. Christ hates the sin, but loves the sinner. There it is, an opposite. Please read now. This will be the spirit of all who follow him. And this would be the spirit, not the former, but the latter. Please read now the Christian love. Christian love is slow to censure, uh -huh. quick to discern penitence, uh -huh. ready to forgive, uh -huh. to encourage, to set the wanderer in the path of holiness and to stay his feet therein. Friends, that is the object of heaven in the latter part. But we see the world's perspective. Man hate the sinner, but they love his sin. As a matter of fact, Thomas Watson, we've been using Thomas Watson uh, frequently in this series. And Thomas Watson, we believe, he wrote more about repentance than any other uh, Puritan. Thomas Watson said this now. He said, those who love sin instead of hating it are far from repentance. They, they are nowhere near the radar of repentance. He says now, to, to, he says, to the godly, sin is a thorn in the eye. To the wicked, it is a crown on their head. He says, now this is serious, friends. The, the profundity of this, man, this man's theology. He says now, loving sin is worse than committing sin. Lord have mercy. What is the difference? There is a big difference. Look how he qualifies now himself. Now he says now, a good man may run into a sinful action unawares. In other words, sin ambushes him. He says, but to love sin is, is desperate. To love sin shows that the will is in sin and the more the will is there, is there, sorry, and the more, the more of the will there is in sin, the greater the sin will be, friends. There it is, friends. That is the attitude of the world. And that's why Jesus says, love not the world, nor the world's things. If you love the world, you'll begin to take on the world's definition, the world's mindset. And we have to be in the world, yes, but we are not of the world. We are pilgrims passing through this old wicked, sinful, as Mr. Bunyan called it, vanity fair. Now, number four now. So we see now what heaven's perspective of sin is. God hates sin, loves the sinner. The world, yeah, he loves the sinner and he loves the sin in some cases. is that right? Now, since we are not of the world, number four now, what then should be our stance on sin and the sinner? <coughs> Pardon me. What should be our stance? The Christian now. We're not talking about the world. The Christian. Psalms 97, verse 10. Look what David says now. David says now, this is, this is crucial now. David says now, Ye that love thy Lord. Hate evil, Lord have mercy. In other words, if you love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind, if you claim to be heaven bound, Holy Ghost filled, water baptized, Christ is alive, you will hate evil. He that loved thy Lord must hate 
evil exceedingly in all its forms. Therefore now, likewise, the Christians, Christians are to hate what God hates. Example, sin. And love what God loves. Example, our, fe our fellow man. The phrase love, love the sinner, hate the sin merely serves as a reminder that we are to love others while at the same time hating the sin that they practice. As a matter of fact, please read now. We're to, uh, they, uh, no, what I said now, the thoughts now. I can what? I can love the thief while hating his theft. Uh -huh. I can love the liar while hating his lies. All right. I can love the alcoholic while hating his alcoholism. Uh -huh. I can love the adulterer while hating his adultery. Uh -huh. I can love the homosexual while hating his <coughs> homosexuality. But friends, the world don't want that. The world wants you to love the homosexual and love homosexuality. The world wants you to love the alcoholic and love alcohol. Love adultery and love adulterers. Love the sinner, love the sin. That's the world's attitude, but that's not the Christian's attitude, friends. And that should not be the church. And there should be no safe place for people who are practicing sin, all kind of sin. I can love the gluttony and the glutton while hating gluttony. Christians are never to endure sin, nor can we knowingly interact with someone in such a way to give credence to their sins, brothers and sisters. As a matter of fact, you know, it is not natural for us to love the sinner and hate his sins. We are born with a, with, a, with a proclivity to love the sinner and love his sins. And so when now, when there is a, a hatred, an enmity between the, the sin and not the sinner, that is a fruit born of the heavenly tree. We are told, as a matter of fact, this is a powerful statement now, we are told in um, uh, Acts of the Apostles, please read now, to hate and reprove. To hate and reprove sin, and at the same time to show pity and tenderness for the sinner is a difficult attainment. It's not natural. Either we come down, either we go to extremes, brothers and sisters. We go to excesses. Please read now. The more earnest our own efforts to attain to holiness of heart and life, the more acute will be our perception of sin and the more decided our disapproval of any deviation from the right. So friends, as we are drawing near to Jesus, nearer my God to thee in repentance, in, 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 in holiness, our senses now will become more acute. In other words, it's almost, you know, probably this is a bad example. When I used to watch Spider-Man, you know, he had get, gotten bitten by a spider, that Greek mythological thing. And whenever he would danger, he would hear, you would hear, beep, 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 my spider sense would be coming. And so friends, as we are drawing nearer to heaven, what people see as innocent, our perceptions are now honed, sharpened, right? We are told now we must guard against. We must guard against undue severity toward the wrongdoer. All right, so guard against the undue, friends, you got to get this now, this loving the sinner and hating the sin, reproving the sinner, but still loving the sinner, right? But we must also be careful not to lose sight of the exceeding sinf sinfulness of sin. So there's two extremes. Now look, what, look what the unregenerate heart does now. Please read now. There is, there, need. There is need of showing Christ-like patience and love for the erring one. Uh -huh. But there is also danger of showing so great toleration for his error that he will look upon himself as undeserving of reproof uh -huh. and will reject it as uncalled for and unjust. Wow, a balance. Now, here it is. And we're told now, ministers of the gospel sometimes do great harm by allowing their, their, their forbearance towards the erring to degenerate into tolerance of sin and even participation in them. Friends, and this is happening too often in the Adventist church. This is where we are today. We have moved from liberty to libertinism. We have moved from the dubious to the dangerous. We have, and none will prophesy, none can prophesy where we will end, friends. She says now, uh, thus they are led to excuse and palliate that which God condemns. And after a time, they become so blinded as to con commend the very ones whom God commands them to reprove. You get that, friend? So when God says, go reprove a person, 
We are now commending them. And this is the flip side now. He who has blunted his spiritual perception by sinful leniency towards those whom God condemns will ere long commit a greater sin by severity and harshness towards those whom God approves. So in other words, friends, the man, a system can become so corrupt where they look towards sin with so long with favor that, that the, the ones that they should fire are the ones that they hire. And the ones that they should hire, they, fight, they don't want to hire. You see what, from friends, it's a danger. And that's why we must ask God, and we do not want friends. I'm going to tell you something, friends. I, listen, the day, the day I come to a point in my life where when my sins are pointed out and I begin to justify, or, 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 that's the day I need, I, need to, I need to take a seat. And may, may my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. Where whenever I am reproved for my sin, I begin to justify and rationalize or even uh, come to a point now where you're showing leniency to those people whom God says reprove and hatred to those whom God, whom God approves, friends. Therefore, friends, we are told one more reference, volume 5, 171, the spirit of Christ will lead us to hate sin. While we are willing to make any sacrifice to save the sinner, friends. There must be a hatred for sin. An exceedingly, exceedingly, exceedingly full, I'm lost for words tonight, hatred. Friends, are we there? Are you, have you come to a point now where you can truly say, Lord, by your grace, I hate sin. Friends, if we have not gotten there, then our repentance is a farce. And our repentance must need be repented of. So what then now? So the call is now to hate sin. Love the sinner, hate sin. Number four now. If the sinner is to hate sin, hatred for sin must be viewed from three perspectives. What are they? Friends, if we're going to hate sin, if we're going to have the same hatred that, that heaven has for sin. We must now begin to view sin from three perspectives. Let's examine him. One, friends, we must learn to look at the origin of sin. Because, friends, the further you look back hmm, is the further you see in the future. And if you don't know where you're coming from, you don't know where you're going. We must now study. And you need to go and read that chapter in Great Controversy, uh, The Origin of Evil, and in Patience and Prophet, why was, sin per why was Sin Permitted? Those are powerful chapters that gives us some insight and some force as to the origin of sin. Now, who was the first created being that sinned? The Bible says in 1 John 3, 8, He that committed sin is of the devil. So when we love sin, we have, we have been amalgamated. We have been wedded to the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. Here it is, the first creature that sinned. If you're going to hate sin, you must not go back and look at the origin of this thing that we're called to hate. And how did it, how did it materialize to where we are today? Friends, we are told in the book, Great Controversy, this is such a powerful statement. Friends, I tell you, I had to weep tonight. Please read now. We are told it is impossible. It is impossible to explain the origin of sin uh -huh. so as to give a reason for its existence. Yet enough may be understood concerning both the origin and the final disposition of sin to make fully manifest the justice and benevolence of God in all his dealings with evil. Here it is now, friends. Get this point now. Please read on nothing. Nothing is more plainly taught in scripture than that God was in no wise responsible for the entrance of sin. Friends, I'm telling you, God is not responsible for the sins down here. Please read now that there. That there was no arbitrary withdrawal of divine grace. Uh-huh. No deficiency in the divine government. Did you hear that, friends? There was no crack, no fracture. There's a whole lot of fracture in the Biden government, in the Putin's government, not to mention Trump government, but there's no fracture in the heaven of, in God's government. Please read now. That gave occasion for the uprising of rebellion. Friends, you know, today we see uprising. 
uprising, uprising, and in some of these cases, there are reasons for uprising. In a sense, uh, people have been shot, and there is either, 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 either as Persian says, uh, oppression on one hand, or discontent on the other hand, but these things birth uprising. But there was no reason for sin to arise. There was no reason for Lucifer to launch a revolt against the God of heaven. There was no reason, friends. And if you're going to hate sin, we must now go back and look at the origin and the genesis of things. You will never hate a thing that you're called unless you know what it's all about, friends. And that's why in, in evangelism, we, you know, we study, we, we teach on Lucifer and, and the great controversy and how sin, we have to do it because we're called to hate this thing called sin. She says, now, sin is an intruder. It forces its way into God's government. Please read now. For whose presence no reason can be given. Can be for, can be given. It is mysterious, uh -huh. unaccountable. Mm -hmm. To excuse it is to defend it. Friends, if you ever seek to excuse sin, you're defending it by default. Please read now. Could excuse for it be found or cause be shown for its ex 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 existence, it would cease to be sin. It's what we say, sin. It's a mystery. Please read now our only definition. Of sin is that given in the word of God, uh -huh. it is the transgression of the law. A what? A Outworking. Working of oh. a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. Friends, I've learned that if sin was one great fish, we might outswim it. If sin was one great beast, we might outrun it. But friends, sin takes on a thousand shapes and form and nobody ever does it all, brothers and sisters. And I've learned two things about sin. It will keep you longer than you plan to stay and take you further than you plan to go. If we are called to hate sin, we must now go back and look at the origin of sin. Note then, sin is the devil's handiwork. That's his stamp, his masterpiece. God has a hand in allowing sin, it is true, but Satan has a hand in acting out sin. Friends, there we must look at the origin of sin if we're going to hate sin. The second thing we must, we must look at, study deeply, if we're going to hate sin, fill it in now, look at how sin makes God feel. How does sin affect the triune Godhead, the heavenly trio? How does God, how does sin, does, yes, God has feelings. Christ has feelings. The Holy Ghost has feelings. Don't grieve him. How does sin makes God feel? Because if we know, the Bible says, you know, that, that no man ever hated his own flesh. And if you know something is, 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 is annoying you, you, you stop it on your body. Don't you stop it? You do. You do. I remember, man, I was, what was I eating? I was eating something in Jamaica. No, <laughs> probably shouldn't have, that's the problem, I shouldn't have ate it. I was in, I was in uh, Mark Bay and I was, uh, you know, this, the guy, the, 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 uh, the Gizada guy. And this guy, you know, he in Martin Bay, he's, you know, he's, he bakes gizada and 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 gizada and um, peanut cake and, and all these stuff that will kill you, <laughs> boy, pull of sugar. And and I, man, that day I bought three of them, the, the red one with the, we call them red cake, with the white, white and red. And a piece of some a piece of coconut, man, was just in my teeth. And boy, I'm I'm I'm, I'm driving up. You know, and I'm, I got my tongue, and you know how it feels, you're, you're wiggling, and, you're, uh, and I, I just, I had to stop and say, you know, get it out. If it's annoying, you, you stop. How does sin makes God feel? Friends, sin affects God. And if we say we love God, you must stop. One, it dishonors God. He feels dishonored when we commit sin. Romans 2, 23 tells us, Thou that makest boast of thy law, thou, thou breaking the law, through, sorry, through breaking the law, dishonoreth thou God. Sin 
it brings dishonor to God. Not only sin brings dishonor to God, it despises God. Friends, when we commit sin, you know, we are really despising God, you know, to, dis to almost cringe at God. And we learned last week, God asked Jeremiah, what have I done to them? What evil have I done to them for them to treat me this way? Second Samuel, 1 Samuel 2.30, the Bible says now, uh, Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and thy house of thy fathers should walk before me forever. But now, saith the Lord, be it far from me, for, for, for them that honor me, I will honor them, and they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Despise is God, brothers and sisters. So sin dishonors God. Sin despises God. But friends, did you know that sin enrages God? It, get, it gets him stirred up. It gets him hot. And when God gets hot, boy, you need to run. It enrages God. Sin. Ezekiel 16, 43. The Bible says, Because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, but hath fretted me in all these things. Behold, therefore, I will recompense. words, I'm going to recompense. He is now enraged thee in thy way. That thou, that, that, thus saith the Lord God, that thou shalt not commit these lewdness above all thine. Above. Friends, when we begin to, when we, when we, when, when we look upon sin lightly, it, it, it gets God upset. And when God gets upset, you know what he does? The whole world gets drowned, saving only eight. When God gets upset, and there's a, there's a text that says that God is angry with the sinner every day. Right? So sin, it dishonors God. It despises God. It enrages God. Friends, sin, it wearies God. You see, I think it's a, I always say, God can't get weary. It wearies God, brothers. God is tired of sin and sinning. Isaiah 7, 13, the Bible says, And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary man? But will ye weary my God also? Question, will you weary God with this sin? He loads upon us, he, he, rather, he bestows upon us his blessings. And we just load him and reward him with our iniquities, friends. So here we see, it dishonors God. It despises God. It, it, it enrages God. It wearies God. Sin also breaks the heart of God. Rupture his heart. We're told in Ezekiel 6, 9, the Bible says now, And they that escape of you shall remember among the nations whither they shall be carried away, because I am broken with their whorish heart. Israel, when we sin, friends, it breaks God's heart. But lastly, it puts Christ, fill it in, to open shame and crucify him again. Friend, we must look upon the origin of sin. We must also view sin from how does it affect the Godhead. And A, that which affects God should affect us. It should affect us. And thirdly, friends, we must look upon the origin of sin. We must look upon how sin make God feels. But lastly, we must look at the final destination of sin. Because, friends, wherever sin is going, so will the unrepentant sinner. And we know where sin is going. The Bible is very clear. Now, where is sin going, Nathan? Where is sin going? Yeah. Nathan said, hell. Can you give us some scripture? Yes. Let's put it together now. Sin, look at the final destination at sin. The other day I was on an airplane and this, the air hostess said, listen, this flight is going to Jamaica. 
So if you're going elsewhere, you need to get off, brothers and sisters. And if you don't like where sin is going, you're going to have to stop practicing sin because I'm telling you, anywhere sin needs its final end, there the sinner will be. Romans 6.23, the Bible says now, For the wages of sin is death. All right, so we know that sin produces death. Is that right? That's a free assessment, right? So we know that wherever death is, what is present? Sin. Sin. So turn the card over. If there is no death, there is no what? No, if there is no sin, there shouldn't be what? No death. So we know the wages of sin is death. So friends, guess what now? Wherever death dies, <laughs> sin will die. Now, we want to find out where will death finally end up? Because you're not going to find no text that says sin is going to hell. That's not in the Bible. But we can use deductive reasoning now. Now watch it now. Where will death end up? Because death is a, death and sin are first cousin. <laughs> All right, right? So wherever death dies, Sin will die, and wherever death's final origin is, so will sin be. Revelation 20, 14 tells us the final resting place for death. It will be the final resting place for sin. Here it is now. Verse 14 now. And death and hell, which hell in this context is Hades, the, uh, Hades, the grave, it means Shoal, the grave means Shoal in the Old Testament, in the New it means Hades, right? So death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So guess what now? If death is cast in and hell, the grave is cast into the lake of fire, then where is sin going to be? Sin will be also in the lake of fire. And friends, if you allow sin, someone once said sin is a hitch hitchhiker, longing to go home. Sin will not walk into hell. It must be carried there by someone or something. And if you allow sin to grab hold of your frock, <laughs> or your skinny jeans, talk to me now, or your straight pants, you must know where you're going. There were two goats in the sanctuary as we close. One was the, the Lord's goat and the, and the scapegoat. Now, when you look at the scapegoat, Moses said this about the scapegoat in the book of Leviticus chapter 16, verse 20, and the scapegoat represents Satan. We are told now, And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle, the congregation, the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities, all the sins, all the abominations of the children of Israel, all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the scapegoat, and thou shalt send him away and be led by a fit man into the wilderness. Friends, what we are seeing based on this illustration is sins final resting place and when sin is buried there will not be a resurrection because Nahum says affliction shall not sin or wickedness or iniquity or abomination will not rise a second time it rises a first time but it's not going to rise a second time friends if we are going to hate this thing called sin we must look at the origin of sin we must look at how sin makes the Godhead feels we must look at the final destination of sin. So what then, friends? You know, we are told, for all have sinned. And tonight, we need help. We need deliverance. And there may be somebody who is watching tonight you're saying, Lord, I don't know how I can make it. Because this sin thing is a skin thing. <laughs> Boy, if I could just tear off my skin, it's this thing, I'm so wedded to evil. Is there any hope? Friend, listen, there is hope for you. And you ought not think and talk like that. Because when you begin to think like that, you've lost the battle already. 
The man who thinks he's pure has already struck the first note. And so tonight, you may have sinned today grievously. You may not have loathed sin, but love sin. You may have wandered in the path of sin. You may be practicing sin right now and you're begging God for deliverance. Friends, there is hope. I want to read to you a, a comforting statement that times when I am ambushed by sin or as I choose the path of sin, I oftentimes reflect back to this passage, this reading, the, the thoughts that were inspired by Mr. Spurgeon. Look what Spurgeon said about the sinner or the Christian who falls into sin or who may not have loathe sin as he should. There is hope tonight, friends. I want to leave you on a high and on a hopeful note tonight. We are told, he that is saved hate sin and loathes it, friends. And though he committed sin, it is by infirmity, weakness. He says, and even when his will giveth consent unto sin, yet it giveth still a deeper and more confident assent unto the law after he had sinned. And, what, and he moaneth and bemoaneth itself exceedingly on the account of sin, friends. Even though we fall and we sin, we know after this, the Lord, you know, I shouldn't have done it, Lord. Please have mercy upon me. Please forgive me, friends. And when you cry out like that, friends, I'm going to tell you something. You will get heaven's attention. Mr. Spurgeon said now, if you saw a fish in a tree, you would know it was not in its element. And if you see a Christian in sin, you will be able to discover that he is not in his element. He goes on to say, if sin be pleasure to thee, if thou canst sail down its streams and rejoice in it, canst drink its draught and make merry with those that merry therein, then deceive not thyself, for thou art not a Christian. You have not been born again, and you need to be born again. You have not repented. If we can merit those who merit sin, then deceive that yourself. You're not Christian. You're not ready for this thing yet, for lack of word. Then he says, no, I love it not, friends. He says, no, if, 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 ah, oh boy, thank you, Jesus. This is so encouraging tonight for me. If you see a sheep fall in the mire, what does it do? It is quick enough to get up again. But if the swine, and we likened a few weeks ago that sinners are likened to swine. If the swine falls there, it wallows in it again and again and nothing but the whip or the stick can make it arise but he says friends so that there is an essential difference between the righteous and the wicked even in their sins a righteous man falleth seven times but he riseth up again today. You may have been knocked down, but praise God, you were knocked out. Hallelujah. A just man, he falleth seven times. Perfection, it tells me, once he gets to the seventh time, there's no more falling because the grace of God can keep you. He says now, but the wicked, like the swine, it rolls and revels in his sin, abiding and continuing in it. Friends, what am I trying to say tonight? The clarion call tonight for my house and for your house is repentance. Let's not deceive ourselves or let others deceive you. And just in case you didn't get what I've said these past 12 lessons or you have not really you know you know you know you know you know process the hatred for sin well let me sum it up 
in what that great old Puritan once said. Let me bring it down to you now in layman terminology. Let me just summarize this, these two lessons in a few verses. You cannot sleep on Delilah, Delilah's lap and expect to wake up in Abraham's bosom. Did you hear what I said tonight, friends? We cannot expect to sleep on Delilah's lap and alas, wake up in Abraham's bosom. So what then, friends? You know, because the Lord is slow to anger, we are so slow to repentance. So tonight, the clarion call is Revelation 3.18, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, be quick. Swiftness must characterize our repentance. And so, friend, what then? I appeal to you as I appeal to myself. Go to your rest at night with every sin confessed. Our God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. O oh God, have mercy upon us. It is not that life that is of the abundant sinner that heaven cringes at. It is that life that seems so noble, upright, virtuous, yet one sin fostered one sin indulged and god if we are honest as we should be tonight there has not been a hatred for sin in our lives as it should be oh we love sin and we love the sinner and these are at war with heaven who hates the sin and loves the sinner lord give us the mind of heaven Take away these things from us. And may, may we be resolute in our stands against sin is our prayer in Jesus' name.